Good evening and welcome to the second public lecture of Psyche. We are Science Gallery Bengaluru, which is a public institution for research-based engagement established by the government of Karnataka. And we work in partnership with the Indian Institute of Science, National Center for Biological Sciences and Tristi Institute of Design, Art and Technology. Psyche is our fifth exhibition and the first one this year. It is entirely online and it deals with the complicated and beauteous nature of the human mind. Today's lecture is supported by the Department of Biotechnology Wellcome Trust India Alliance. Allow me to introduce to you today's speaker, Arthur Miller. His lecture is called Human Psyche, Machine Psyche. Arthur is Emeritus Professor of the History and Philosophy of Science at University College London. He's the author of a groundbreaking theory of creativity, which applies to both humans and machines. He has written many critically acclaimed books, including the Pulitzer Prize nominated Einstein, Picasso, Space Time and the Beauty That Causes Havoc. A regular broadcaster and lecturer, he has judged art competitions, curated exhibitions on art science, and writes engagingly about complex social and intellectual dramas, weaving the personal with the scientific to produce thoroughly researched works that read almost like novels. He has been writing for The Guardian, The New York Times, The Wired, and Nautilus. His most recent book, The Artist in the Machine, The World of AI-Powered Creativity, on AI and creativity in art, literature, and music was published in the fall of 2019 by MIT Press. Do come back and join us tomorrow. We have uh, The Serpent of a Thousand Coils, a masterclass by Anuj Malhotra at 2 p.m. and another public lecture by S.P. Arun at 6.30 p.m. called The Incredible Perception Lab Inside Your Head. You can type in your questions in the Q&A box and of course, do leave us your feedback. And with this, I'll hand over to Arthur. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you, John V, for your uh, generous introduction. And I thank you all for attending today my talk, however virtually. Okay, let me now share screens. The human psyche is made up of everything in the mind. But what are the components of the mind? How do they function? And what about a machine psyche? Is there a connection be between it and ours? Is the ability to think and feel unique to humans? These are among the questions that I will delve into today. Now, as a model of the human psyche, I turn to the great Swiss psychologist Carl Jung's theory. And as an application of it, I will discuss his analysis of the brilliant physicist Wolfgang Pauli and how Pauli made a highly significant discovery using Jung's dream analysis. This is a picture of Jung and Pauli, how they looked in 1932 when Pauli came to Jung for help. Now, Jung and Pauli were bigger than life, even outside their fields of study. Jung hugely enjoyed the outdoors. Here he is in about 1920 in a cooking trench, sitting in a cooking trench with an outdoor fireplace next to him. Jung also built impressive stone towers by hand, such as this one in Burlingen on the shores of Lake Zurich, which he worked on from 1923 to, 1940, to 1956, 43 years. It was Jung's way to relax and think. While Pauli preferred bars and cafes, now here he is taking part in a rare outdoor activity, tongue in cheek, of course. Pauli had a wicked sense of humor with cynical remarks such as, why that's not even wrong, usually directed at someone trying to explain their own ideas, which Pauli considered to be rubbish. There's, there's essentially no comeback to it. And in this picture, Pauli may well be saying that to someone in the audience. Another of Pauli's trademark cynical quips is, so young and so unknown. And then there is the Pauli effect. Things often broke down when he was around. Things ranging, ranging from expensive experimental setups to priceless Ming vases. Once at Göttingen University, one such experimental setup suddenly broke down. The director of the lab discounted the Pauli effect because Pauli was not around, or was he? It turns out that at the, at the moment when the equipment malfunctioned, Pauli happened to be changing trains at Göttingen station. Regarding the Ming vase, Pauli had just entered a room where Jung was lecturing. When there was a crash, a priceless Ming vase had fallen off a shelf and shattered. Pauli believed that he radiated fields of force. Here he is sailing in 1923 on Lake Zurich with three of the stellar postdocs that were attracted to him. Pauli is seated on the right looking somewhat Faustian. And on the left 
is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, perhaps the Pauli effect was the reason why, some years later, Oppenheimer turned down Pauli's request to work on at Los Alamos on the atomic bomb. Imagine Pauli around all that explosive material. Jung, under, Jung understood the psyche as the sum total of what constitutes the human mind. As Jung wrote, psyche is for me a general term indicating the substance of all the phenomena of the inner world. In Jung's theory, the unconscious includes the personal unconscious and the mysterious collective unconscious, of which more in a moment. First, let me further jog your, your memory of who Carl Jung was. On a pop side, he set words like introvert and extrovert into our everyday vocabulary. Born in 1875, Jung grew up in Northern Switzerland where, where religion and superstition went hand in hand. His dissertation in medical school on the psychology and pathology of the so-called occult phenomena reflected this uh, line of thought. In the first decade of the 20th century, Jung was Sigmund Freud's closest associate. Freud thought of Jung as his intellectual heir and successor, but then turned against him. Whereas Freud believed that the workings of the human psyche could be explained ultimately with the laws of physics and chemistry, Jung was adamant that one had to go beyond science as well as Freud's theory of the psyche, the foundation of the psychoanalysis. Freud compared the psyche to an iceberg where 90% of the action goes on underneath the water. For Freud, it is in the unconscious, which is made up of the id, ego, and superego. These three elements struggle among themselves, all the while being driven by strong sexual undercurrents. But Jung believed that the human psyche was much too complex to be understood merely in terms of a sexual drive. To Jung, going beyond science and Freud's psychoanalysis could only be accomplished with a framework that included mysticism, alchemy, and religion. Freud vociferously resisted Jung's parapsychology. During one of their fierce arguments, Jung felt like his diaphragm was burning like a piece of red hot iron. Suddenly, there was a loud report in a huge bookcase with glass doors next to them. They both jumped back, fearing the bookcase would fall on them. Jung interpreted what had happened as an example of a physical effect caused by a mental thought. Sheer bosh, replied Freud. They never discussed the incident again. Evidently, it's become so famous that it has hit the comic books. Now, unlike Freud, Jung was interested in aspects of the unconscious that could not be attributed to an individual's personal development, like their day-to-day -day struggles, but to a deeper non-personal realm common to humankind, the collective unconscious, whose contents he called archetypes. Archetypes are latent potentialities whose origins remain forever obscure because they reside in a mysterious shadow realm of the collective unconscious, whereas the archetype itself is not representable. When energized, it bubbles up into, into consciousness as an archetypal image. And it is in this way that archetypes can influence our thoughts, feelings, and actions. The collective unconscious mixes with the personal unconscious, providing a structural basis for our psychic life. It increases the ability of the unconscious to be a seed of creativity through dreaming, which is at the heart of Jungian analysis. Jung noticed from his clinical practice that patients recovering from bouts of deep depression often dreamt of certain symbols found in esoteric cults and alchemy, and which appeared in cultures across the globe and date into deep history, such as the mandala, usually circular with four objects symmetrically placed. The mandala is an example of an archetype constellated into consciousness as an image. This, this mandala was drawn by Jung in 1916 in the course of his painful self-analysis, which appeared in his Red Book. Wolfgang Pauli was born in Vienna in 1900. He's 25 years younger than uh, Jung. Uh, he was a wunderkind in physics. It all came so easy to him. As his teacher Arnold Sommerfeld wrote to a colleague, I have around me a really astonishing specimen of the intellectual elite of Vienna and the young Pauli. Classmates recalled that he read advanced math and physics texts as if they were novels. He received his PhD at age 21 with a thesis showing that the prevailing atomic theory of the day, formulated by the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr, was beset with serious problems and so could not be the final theory of the atom. According to Bohr's atomic theory, uh, the atom is a minuscule solar system. 
uh, with a center which is made up of a positively charged nucleus, which acts like the sun in our solar system with, elect with electrons going around the central sun like planets, except the electrons could only be in certain orbits. And each of these orbits only had a certain number of electrons, two in the first orbit, eight in the second, 18 in the third, and so on. Bohr could not substantiate how he arrived at these numbers, but Pauli could. Three years later, in 1924, Pauli discovered the exclusion principle, which explained why there were only two electrons in the first ring, eight in the second, 18 in the third, and so on. It was, it, uh, it was cosmic in extent. It made sense in the periodic table in that here you have the upper left hydrogen with one electron in the inner ring, then moving across to helium, which, which has two electrons in the inner ring, completing it. And so helium does not react any longer chemically, it's inert. Then you move along to lithium, which has three electrons, two in, in the completed inner ring and one in, in the beginning to fill up second ring. And then at neon has 10 electrons, the completed inner ring with two, the second ring with eight. Neon is also inert. The exclusion principle explained why metals are hard and why certain stars expire as they do. As I said, it was truly cosmic. This led, this led to Pauli's Nobel Prize 21 years later. On his personal side, there were severe problems. Pauli was a man so strange that most physicists today cannot come to grips with his personality or his views about the relation between the worlds of science and of the mind. At the time, he didn't notice that he had one foot in the world of 20th century science and the other in the world of the occult. No wonder that a scientific idol was the great 17th century eccentric German astronomer, Johannes Kepler, who struggled to find an order and harmony in the world through science, astrology, and religion. Despite the key role Pauli played in the rise of quantum physics in the 1920s, he considers himself, he considers himself to be an abject failure as a scientist and as a person. Uh, he berated himself for having revealed deep faults in Bohr's theory. But Bohr, himself, but Bohr himself and others lauded Pauli's work. Bohr went on to invite Pauli to Copenhagen to study with him, and he gave Pauli a problem to solve, which Pauli failed to solve, but so did everyone else. But Pauli internalized it as a personal failure. All this was exacerbated by the suicide of his beloved mother and the short-lived disastrous marriage. He drifted into the underworld of drugs, alcohol, and prostitution. By day, he was a stay at hair professor, doctor, physics professor. In the evenings, he spent in bars, usually drunk and seeking prostitutes. In every way, he was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. By 1932, Pauli had deteriorated to such an extent that his father urged him to see Jung, who lived in a fortress-like mansion just outside of Zurich, where Pauli was a professor at the highly prestigious Swiss Polytechnic Institute, the ETH. This is uh, Pauli's analysis room in 2007 when I visited the Pauli house. Partially obscured on the left is one of Pauli's grandsons, Andreas, who takes care of the house. There are two easy chairs. Uh, this one faces Jung's extensive library of, of ancient alchemical texts. And the other one has a beautiful view of Lake Zurich. Pauli, of course, chose the one facing Jung's bookcase. Jung would sit on the couch and the table in front was piled high with books and, uh, and papers. Jung's analysis room doubled as a study. And this is what it looked like in 1946 with Jung sitting on the chair on the left. Jung recalled when Pauli, when Pauli first entered my house, I by myself felt the wind blowing over from the lunatic asylum. That's how bad Pauli looked. Jung saw before him a young man of excellent scientific education but a very one-sided intellectual, a hard-boiled rationalist who did his best to evade his emotional needs as a waste of time since they had nothing to do with science. Now, the methodical person he was, Pauli had carefully prepared for his first visit with Jung by reading Jung's seminal text, Psychological Types, shown here. All these books belong, belong to Pauli, and they are right now stored at La Salle Pauli, in CERN, the Nuclear Physics Research Establishment in Geneva. Uh, in psychological types, Jung established a vocabulary and framework for his analytical psychology, so-called to distinguish it from Freud's psychoanalysis. 
on the basis of his clinical experience and vast knowledge of Eastern and Western religions, philosophy, and literature, Jung offered a topology of the psyche based on two opposing psychological types, the extrovert and introvert, and he fine-tuned these notions with the four basic functions paired off in two, thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensation. The dominating functions give each individual their own psychology. Thinking types direct their conscious energy in thinking at the expense of feeling, which becomes the inferior function. In extreme circumstances, the undeveloped or inferior function lapses into the unconscious and returns to its earlier archaic state, becoming incompatible with the favored one. In this case, energy associated with the inferior function flows into the, into the consciousness and produces fantasies which could lead to a neurosis. Now we are all combinations of the two types and the four functions. Our psyche, our psyche results from the struggle between opposites for equilibrium. The goal of Jung's method is to retrieve and develop inferior functions. How did he accomplish this? Well, through alchemy. As Jung wrote, I realized that alchemists were talking in symbols those old acquaintances of mine. Jung sought to identify a person's dream images with symbols from alchemy, religion, and myth, all the while taking into account his topology of the psyche. He understood this process as a dialectical discussion between a person's conscious and unconscious, in which patients eventually meet their shadow or dark side, which can be separated, if they are men, from their anima or female side. This enables the patient to come to terms with the fact that he, is, he himself is a combination of light and dark, good and evil, and thus, thus obtaining a balanced personality. Early on, Jung pegged Pauli as an introverted thinking type and depicted his psyche like this. Thought or thinking is totally in, in consciousness, while feeling is totally in the unconscious. The other two functions, intuition and sensation, which take part in thinking along the lines of hunches, etc., uh, are partly in the conscious, partly in the unconscious. In other words, Pauli's psyche was a mess. So let's take a look at Jung's analysis of some of Pauli's uh, earlier dreams. As Jung wrote to Pauli in 1933, I think it will be best for you if we resume our customary Monday sessions at noon. Pauli had evidently missed a couple of sessions. Uh, when Pauli came to, uh, to when, Pauli, when Pauli came to Jung, in 1932, he had already dreamt uh, about, about around 400 dreams. Uh, by 1934, he had dreamt over a thousand dreams and he kept on dreaming. And he wrote up these dreams in, in great detail. Uh, in this dream, an early dream, Pauli is surrounded by a group of vague female forms. He hears a voice within him say, I'm, first, I must get away from father. But the sentence is incomplete, says Jung. It must be completed by, in order to follow the, the, the unconscious, those seductive female forms. Jung rises from his couch, walks over to his impressive collection of ancient alchemical uh, texts. He chooses one from the 16th century and opens it up to a page where this image is. The maidens are the unconscious, the intuit intuitive thinking, vis-a-vis -vis the male logic thinking. The, the, uh, standing next to them is Hermes the ancient Hellenic name for the central figure in alchemy, Mercurius, who plays the role of mediator between lightness and darkness. He is a psychopomp, just as Jung moves between the conscious and the unconscious. Jung informs Pauli that the father is not Pauli's real father, but represents the traditional masculine world of intellectualism in opposition to the unconscious. The dreamer feels as if acknowledging the unconscious, the female side of himself, means sacrificing his rationalism. At this point, the dreamer has the option of running from his unconscious, but he prefers not to. The problem he faces is how to do this. A few days later, Pauli has another dream. He dreams that he is rooted in the center of a circle formed by a serpent biting its own tail. Once again, you gets up from his couch, walks over to his uh, library of alchemical texts, picks out another one from the 16th century and opens it to this image. It is a picture of the creature alchemists call the Euroboros, a serpent who devours his own tail and gives birth to himself. The Euroboros symbolizes the eternal circle with the four Aristotelian elements, 
earth, water, air, and fire, continually are transformed into one another until the quintessence, the fifth element, is achieved. This is the highest level, and this is the highest level of enlightenment and alchemy, the philosopher's stone. In Jung's analytical psychology, it is individuation, where individuation is a centering of the self between the conscious and the unconscious, a process linked with the appearance of symbols, such as the anima in men, as well as the mandala. In this balanced state of the conscious and the unconscious, in this balanced state, the conscious and the unconscious can be switched like, a, like in a mirror, and individuation remains the same. But that's far off for Pauli. Right now, Jung says, the circular form taken by Euroboros is the first hint of the symmetrical form of a mandala, suggesting that change is beginning to occur in Pauli's psyche. The area that the Euroboros encircles, called the Taminos, is a protected area where the dreamer, Pauli, can safely come face to face with his unconscious, with all its unpleasantries and monsters. Jung's analysis will help Pauli achieve individuation, hopefully that is. Well, after two grueling years of analysis, Pauli did in, indeed achieve individuation. And he drew this mandala. Now, Pauli was not a very good artist, so his drawing really you know, doesn't show you the complexity and depth of the mandala. Here it is redrawn by an artist. It was complex. And Jung was not surprised at his complexity considering who Pauli was. Pauli's mandala goes deeply into numerology and alchemy, as we would expect from someone steeped in Kepler's writings and the writings of Robert Flood and other medieval thinkers and Renaissance thinkers, as well as Jung's theory of the psyche. Briefly, Pali's mandala contains three pulses. The first pulse is this ticker that ticks through the 32 segments. And when it ticks through the 32 segments once, the second pulse is generated in that the horizontal circle turns by, by one over 32. When the ticker ticks through the 32 segments 32 times, the horizontal circle goes to one complete rotation. And this gives rise to the third pulse in that this golden ring undergoes a 360 degree rotation. The golden circle, the golden ring, represents Pali's anima, which has been liberated from his dark side and shines like the sun. Jung has told Pali that the myth of how in deep history, a matriarchal world was brought violently to a close and femininity was cast into the darkness of the unconscious. This meant a shift in the world's psyche toward, the mas toward masculinity. In ancient myths, even numbers are interpreted as feminine and odd numbers as masculine. In Pali's mandala, the three pulses signifying the trinity, three are contained within the horizontal circle with its four colors, the quaternity, four. This, says Jung, satisfies the role played by alchemy, which is to right the wrong of casting femininity into the unconscious. All along, the thrust of Jung's therapy was a movement from three to fours. Pali's neurosis was rooted in the predominance of his thinking functions. The other three functions were not fully in the unconscious. Jung's therapy enabled Pali to accept his feeling function with its rationality, which entailed separating his anima or female side from the shadowy world of the unconscious, which included the collective unconscious. So with Jung's help, Pali opened up from three to four thinking functions. This transition from three to four was exactly what he, what he had been up against with his, with his exclusion principle in 1924. It required four numbers to specify the state of an electron in an atom, not three as would be expected since space is three dimensional. Pali angsted over this result and fought really quite violently with colleagues who felt that, that there could only be four quantum numbers. It turned out, and, and this result seemed to be forced on them from nature, but only Pali was willing to accept it. It turned out that in 1924, Pali was struggling with a physics problem as well as with problems with his psyche. Some years later, he recalled, thus on the psychological line, this time I have once again bumped into the problem of the transition from three to four. In neither case was it by any means Mr. C.G. Jung who suggested it to me, nor was there a, del a deliberate conscious intention. Consequently, I am rather certain that objectively there is an important psychological and perhaps natural philosophical problem with these numbers. In fact, Pali 
considered them, considered three and four to be archetypes. Jung had already arrived at that result. Now, friends and colleagues complimented Pally on seeming happier and less cynical. And indeed, Pally's uh, interactions with women improved greatly. Of course, Pally never mentioned that he underwent analysis with Jung. Uh, Jung's inclusion of mysticism and alchemy into his work had somewhat dented his reputation. Pally swore Jung himself in secrecy, fearing for his own reputation. Only very close friends were let in on a secret. And this did not include Niels Bohr, seated on the left, Werner Heisenberg in the middle, uh, Pauli is on the right. To Pauli, Bohr and Heisenberg were colleagues, not confidants. Now, most physicists are, most scientists are adamant that they don't make discoveries while dreaming. As we have come to expect, Pauli was different. From Jung, he learned the power of dreams. I'm going to tell you about Pauli's dreams, which led to an important discovery he made in physics. In his waking life, Pauli was always preoccupied with issues of symmetry, both in physics and psychology the conscious and the unconscious balancing each other like mirror reflections in order for individuation to occur. He felt himself in balance when he, is sure, when he was sure that the left is the mirror image of the right, as he wrote to Jung. And so mirror symmetry was of the essence to him. It is not surprising that this preoccupation with symmetries should seep into his dreams as well. In 1952, he began in-depth mathematical investigations of symmetries in quantum physics particularly mirror symmetry, also referred to by physicists as parity. In physics, according to mirror symmetry, any physical system and its mirror image should produce the same experimental results. That is, you cannot tell whether you're experimenting on a system or on its mirror image. Mathematically, this means that the equations of elementary particle physics should remain unchanged when left is flipped with right. The mirror symmetry or parity seemed like common sense to physicists. Nobody had ever questioned it. Pauli could not recall why in 1952 he began to look into mirror symmetry because there was nothing really interesting in physics at the time in regard to it. But he did recall a dream he had at that time. He dreamt that he was walking in the constellation Perseus where he encountered the double star Algol, reflection, identical reflections of each other. In fact, Pauli recalled that he spent quite a bit of time walking around in the constellation Perseus. He also recalled from Greek mythology that the demigod Perseus used a mirror to behead the Gorgon Medusa, who turned people who looked at her into stone. By 1954, his dreams convinced him that psychological factors were involved in sparking his interest in mirror symmetry. His musing over, mathematic, over the mathematics of mirror symmetry led him to explore two other reflective symmetries. Charge conjugation C, which where you replace all particles with their antiparticles in the equations of elementary particle physics. We've already mentioned parity P, which means that you shift left and right in all the, in your equations of particle physics. And then time reversal, you reverse the direction of time in your equations of elementary particle physics. In 1954, Pauli discovered CPT symmetry, in which if you apply the three, op the three operations, charge conjugation C, parity P and time reversal T, two equations of elementary particle physics, you get the same equations back. And Pauli was even more astounded by what he next deduced that agreement with CPT symmetry means agreement with relativity, which is a sine qua non in physics. And his exclusion principle enters too. So in 1954, Pauli was a very happy man. Not only had he made an important discovery in physics, but it involved relativity, his first passion in physics, and his first great discovery, also the exclusion principle. CPT symmetry has never been violated. And that's a good thing, because if, if, it, were, if it were, then relativity theory would be violated, and that's not a good thing. At this point, early 1954, Pauli thought that he had discovered something very interesting, a new symmetry, but nothing really big outside of physics. Then later that year in November, Pauli had a dream so curious that it stuck in his mind for years afterwards. He, in the dream, he is with his anima in a room in which experiments are being carried out involving reflections. Others in the room think that the reflections are real objects, and so there is no mirror symmetry. But Pauli and his anima know that they are just mirror images. I think this Magritte image uh, illustrates this, this, this weird 
situation as best as one can. Nevertheless, they worry about there being no symmetry between objects and reflections. From time to time, his anima changes into a Chinese woman of earlier dreams. Jung interpreted the Chinese woman as the holistic side of Jung's anima. Of Pali. Jung interpreted the Chinese woman as the holistic side of Pali's anima and that Chinese philosophy seeks to reconcile opposites, the yin and the yang. Now, two years later, in 1956, two Chinese American physicists, T.D. Lee on the right, C.N. Yang on the left, sent Pali an article in which they argued that perhaps mirror symmetry might not always be conserved. Their study of the scientific literature convinced them that there was very little experimental evidence for it, and certain puzzling phenomena in elementary particle physics could be clarified if parity was not, was not conserved in the so-called weak interactions, which include radioactive decay. Well, Pally chuckled and put it aside, but others took it seriously. On 17 January 1957, a group of experimentalists at Columbia University, headed by a Chinese woman, C.S. Wu, carried out a very beautiful high-precision experiment that proved beyond doubt that parity was violated in the weak interactions. Here is C.S. Wu beaming. This is after her experiment was done. And here is Pally standing next to her, also beaming. In fact, Pally was in his element, went around women, and especially with a drink in hand. As an aside, I mentioned that, that, that C.S. Wu did not, did not share in the, Nobel, in the 1957 Nobel Prize awarded to Li and Yang. And there was a, a third slot open, uh, was for a long time a real blot on the Nobel Prize Committee in Physics. Physics has since more than made up for that. Uh, it was clearly a sexist move. Now, Pauli could not fail to notice what a supreme example of Jungian, synchron Jungian synchronicity this was. A Chinese woman had played an important part in his dreams, particularly those involving mirrors and their reflections. And a Chinese woman had carried out the critical experiment that brought about the downfall of parity. Pauli confessed to his co close colleague, Marcus Fiertz, that the downpour, that downfall of parity caused them to behave irrationally for quite a while. First told Pauli that he had a mirror complex and Pauli admitted as such. Pauli discussed with Jung his shock at the so-called Chinese revolution in physics. In these discussions, Pauli reiterated his belief that mirror symmetry was critical because only if it were valid could the conscious and the unconscious be reflected about the centrally positioned self and so be in balance with each other, leading to individuation, the pinnacle in Jung's theory of the psyche. So no mirror symmetry, no individuation. Pauli concluded that there were, as he had come to suspect, psychological reasons for his discovery of CPT, namely that mirror symmetry is an archetype. Now archetypes reside in the mysterious shadow realm of the collective unconscious. So how did the archetype of mirror symmetry bubble up into consciousness? Pauli's reasoning on this point is a wonderful example of, of Jung's psychology in action, as well as containing certain elements that are now part of modern ideas on creativity. During the day, Pauli had consciously worked on problems of symmetry. The intense, passionate desire to solve a problem keeps it alive in the unconscious, which in Jung's theory of the psyche mixes the personal and collective unconscious. Pauli recalled his vivid dreams about mirroring while he worked on the mathematics of elementary particle physics during the day, dreams such as walking in the constellation Perseus and encountering the double star Algo. Thus was the archetype of mirroring constellated, percolating up into consciousness. This inspired Pauli to work on mirror symmetry, even though no one else was. Pauli concluded that there was a kind of synchronicity because there are unconscious motives when one is involved in something. A further dreams convince Pauli that the relationship between physics and psychology is that of a mirror image. Yet there is no longer any mirror symmetry. But mirror symmetry is an archetype. Pauli continues, before the downfall of parity, physicists and psychologists had considered only partial mirror, mirror images, trivial mirror images, mirror images seen in a glass mirror. What one had to do was to look deeply into the psyche for more profound reflections. And CPT symmetry is a profound reflection or mirror symmetry on the grandest of scales. CPT symmetry asserts that our universe, 
cannot be distinguished from one in which all matter is replaced by antimatter, left is flipped with right, and time is reversed. CPT symmetry is cosmic indeed. We may say it's part of, we may, may we say it's part of the collective unconscious, an archetype, yes, by all means. Next, I turn to machines and what we can say about their psyche and how it parallels with ours in the age of artificial intelligence. More specifically, I'm going to discuss the psyche of an artificial neural network, the guts, the brain of a machine. Now, an artificial neural network is made up of three parts, an input layer where the data to be analyzed sit, and then a middle part made up of layers of uh, artificial neurons wired up to loosely emulate the way the neurons in our brain are wired up. Uh, and it is, it, it is in this middle area where the, the, the data is analyzed, where the machine thinks, where problems are solved. And then the result of the analysis is, is moved to the output, is moved to the output layer. Uh, I'm, going, uh, let, I'm going to discuss the machine psyche uh, using an algorithm called Generative Adversarial Networks, or GAN. This uh, algorithm is set into an artificial neural network, just as algorithms are set into our brain and they help us solve, they help us solve problems. Now, while as of 2012, artificial neural networks were great at recognizing faces and, and animals, they were not so good at, uh, at generating images. Then GAN came on the scene in 2014. Now, a generative adversarial network is made up of two networks, a generator, a generator network, which generates images from nothing, that is to say noise, then it passes these images up to the, up to the discriminator network, which assesses these images, whether they are real or not, relative to what is in its database, relative to what it's been trained on. And if they're not real, it sends the images back to the generator network. Okay, let's say that the discriminator network was trained on tens of thousands of faces scraped from the web. And let's start the process going. The generator network begins to generate images from nothing, from noise. They're just blobs sent up to the discriminator network which immediately sends them back. After thousands of, uh, of iterations, the generator network gets the idea and begins to generate faces like these. These are nice faces. The only problem is they don't correspond to anybody alive on our planet. Uh, what has happened is that the, the algorithm, GAN, has allowed the artificial neural network to imagine to dream, to begin to set up an inner life of its own. These faces are from work done by the AI artist, Mike Tyka, and he calls them imaginary faces. Now, who knows? Maybe sometime in the future, machines may be viable candidates for Jungian analysis. Uh, their dreams may well be of a sort that we presently cannot imagine. Towards further insights into a machine psyche, I bring to your attention that machines have already shown glimmers of creativity in, for example, and, and winning big at complex games such as Go and chess, as well as producing highly interesting and original works of art, literature, and music. So already they have the possibility of being creative like us, but to be end-to-end -end creative, that is to say, to think up their own problems, to say to themselves, I think I'd like to paint the picture of such and such, or uh, write, su write such and such kind of music, or write a novel, of this sort. A machine psyche must have attributes such as emotions and consciousness. Let's look into this. Now, <coughs> people might argue that machines cannot be truly created because they are not out there in the world having emotional experiences like communing with nature or falling in love, but they can acquire such knowledge vicariously. And here's how. In the not too distant future, machines will be able to, will be fluent in a language, and so be able to truly read the web and thus experience being out there and be able to convince us and them and themselves that they have acquired such experiences that seem to be essential to creativity, such as inspiration, anger, love, and hate. And we will go on to wire machines up with complex systems of sensors, regulatory mechanisms, and communication pathways by means of which they will evolve a set of emotions that are duplicates of ours. When machines form the brains of robots, they will discover a world of touch 
which can enhance their experience of emotions, as well as adding to their psyche, ways of dealing with the world, such as constructing the notion of object permanence, and so abstract thought, and hopefully common sense too. Now, what about consciousness? What is it? And will machines ever have it? Well, consciousness is our essence, our inner life, our inner being, and it's essential to our consciousness, to our creativity, I should say. Many philosophers argue that consciousness is a private realm that cannot be investigated by science. But in the age of AI, the problem of consciousness and what it is has moved from the philosophical to the scientific. I believe that in not too many years, machines will possess emotions and consciousness. One way to program consciousness into a machine is setting up its architecture, its psyche, so that it can generate mental models to deal with data from certain situations. It is not the sum total of these mental models is the machine's consciousness. It is not too far-fetched for me to say that eventually it may turn out that the machine's unconscious will be a personal unconscious and a sort of collective unconscious too. Because after all, in the future, machines will be loaded with all the knowledge that has ever accrued on the planet Earth, which includes alchemy and myths. So to summarize, we may say that Jung and Pauli possessed imaginations that range far and deep well beyond their fields of study. I have discussed Pally's effective use of Jung's theory of the psyche with his dream formalism to discover a fundamental law of physics, as well as helping him deal with his neurosis. Jung's and Pally's was a truly unique meeting of the minds. As Jung reminisced with Pally, he could enter the no man's land between physics and the psychology of the unconscious, the most fascinating, yet the darkest hunting ground of our time. Regarding the machine psyche, at first the machine's components will be made, will, will, which make up its architecture, will evolve a psyche that is a duplicate of ours. That will be in the age of artificial general intelligence when machines will be as smart as us. Then I could imagine that components of the psyche will evolve to produce one that differs from ours in ways we cannot presently imagine. This will be part of the age of artificial superintelligence when machines will be much, much smarter than us because machines have the potential for unlimited creativity. Well, why not all of these changes? After all, does not a machine's physiology differ from ours? Right now, it's silicon. Who knows what it will be in the future? Certain algorithms even allow machines right now to dream, to imagine, to begin to build up an inner life of their own, such as generative adversarial networks, which, which we just discussed. So today, we're, we are on the verge of replying in the affirmative to Philip K. Dick's questions, do androids dream of electric sheep? Perhaps they will be able to dream of us too. It is also good to bear in mind that we are well on the way to merging with them, the others, the machines. For more of what I've said today, I, I suggest you look at my books, 137 and The Artist and the Machine. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, for that uh, absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, so as a historian of physics, I have, I have looked at Pauli's work, but I was um, I have not read 137. And, and so I was not aware of this um, absolutely fascinating story. Oh, well, you must do that. <laughs> I, I, I will, I absolutely will now. So let me, let me so I, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And in the meanwhile, I'll get us started. I. I was, you know, given that you and I sh sort of partially share a profession in that I'm a historian of science, I don't, I'm, I'm not a philosopher of science or, or neither do I do HPS. But what I'm always fascinated by is the persistence of, um, you know, what, what in many ways in modern physics, we, we haven't kind of, uh, or well, in modern science, we haven't kind of wanted to continue with say, so things like alchemy, the ether, uh, the occult, and they, they continue to have um, have interesting lives in practice and in the way, <coughs> in the self understanding in the constitution of the self of many many practitioners of modern science. What are your observations on the persistence of ideas that, in many ways, we are at least told to believe have been discredited? Well, uh, Pauli actually believed that there will be a new form of alchemy emerging. The old forms are 
are in the past, new forms of alchemy will emerge. And he believed that uh, physics and uh, uh, mirror Im uh, physics and alchemy, essentially, uh, sorry, physics and psychology are mirror images of are mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pali also believed, and it's it's true that to, to a very large extent, that uh, he believed that that physics was at a dead end and that it could not deal with psychology. And when physicists talk about a theory of everything, that, that's really a misnomer. Mm -hmm. It may be a theory of elementary particle physics, but not, it's not a theory of life, love, hate, and, and, and so on. What's, what's interesting that, I mean, when I first think I, I was, I knew being interested in creativity, I, I, was, I, I had read a lot of Jung. I actually found Jung more interesting than Freud. Mm -hmm. And of course I knew a lot about Pauli uh, being a, uh, a physicist. But some years ago, I discovered the, the book he uh, uh, co-authored, in a sense, with Jung, uh, in which the, the, the interpretation of nature and the psyche, in which uh, Jung wrote his book, on, his, his article on synchronism, which Pauli helped him a great deal with. And, uh, and Pauli wrote on Kepler and, and archetypes. So that really amazed me. What, what, what was, comes out in their relationship is that each one considered the other's field of study as, as, very, as very important. And Pali felt that should be the case. And what, what is the case is that images, myths prevail. They, they're just there uh, through time, in, even, mm -hmm. even today, of, of entanglement, for example, that there, that there is, uh, is something out there that you can't quite put your, put your finger on. And, and it may be the case somewhere along the line that uh, the old alchemy will be revisited again. And who knows what new knowledge can be, can be obtained from it. Mm -hmm. But I, but I certainly changed from being a, uh, a, a totally rational physicist when I looked at Pauli. And again, looking at AI, um, I become a, uh, a materialist once again. But again, in, this, in, in machines, uh, what one hears too many times is dystopian scenarios. Yep. And, and you can't, it's really very, it's dangerous, to, almost dangerous to predict more than five years into the future that things are changing at a rate faster than the Darwinian rate of, of millions of years. And that we're merging with machines, it's not such a bad idea because that may be uh, beneficial to survival of the human race, whatever human will mean by mm -hmm. that time, because machines can look into the future, see potential problems and eventually, and, and immediately deal with them, something we don't seem to be very good at. Mm. So I think what you say in many ways reinforces what Stellark was trying to say yesterday as well. Yes. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see that you come to it as a, as a physicist and historian of science as well, and uh, a historian and philosopher of science, and he comes to it from art practice. And I think what, what before I move on to the next question, what, what I wanted to say was that I think what it allows, what, what your lecture today allowed me in many ways to appreciate and go back to is this question, as you, as you very rightly mentioned, of something out there that you don't understand or something out there that's that current state of knowledge doesn't allow you to understand. And individual scientists take different decisions on how they might negotiate that thing that they don't comprehend. And well, as, you, as, as, you, as you put it very nicely, that uh, sometimes one has to go into areas that uh, one feels uh, almost like a criminal going into. To, to understand things you don't understand. In other words, you should leave your mind wide open. Yep, yep. And I think we- It's we, also good, in this sense, the sense of creativity, it's good to be a generalist. To, I mean, Jung and Pauli read widely outside their fields. People that have made great discoveries, really that, that broke open fields were, mm -hmm. were generalists. Einstein, Newton, for example, and, yep. and so on. And, 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 uh, and, and of course, Jung and, uh, and Pauli, and Bohr oh, too. Absolutely. Heisenberg, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think I'm, I'm thinking of the repercussions or the, or the implications of this observation on how we ask questions in history and philosophy of science, right? Because often when I see books that, um, well, not books, but um, scholarship on the question of, say, spirituality or, uh, you know, I mean, you brought up the mandala and Jung and, and you know, Pauli's relationship yeah. with it. Often when we approach these questions, I'm so even hesitant, even using words like that, right? Like spirituality, re religion, consciousness, um, unconscious, but, and you know, and 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 you know how as historians, when we constitute the question of the of of, of the rational world and all of this, all of the rest of it, I think we are losing a lot of knowledge yes, and absolutely. we are losing a lot of depth. 
in terms of the practices of these people who have, in a way, found their own way to negotiate what this when means. I, when, I gave, uh, when I give lots of uh, lectures to the physics department or, or lecture to CERN on, on Jung and Pauli, uh, yeah. people, people became angry in the audience, people who had, who had seen Pauli in, in the flesh, that yeah. I, I'm lying, I, I, made, I made this whole story up. They just can't, can't imagine that, that and, and of course, Pauli kept, kept it more or less a secret too. People knew he was friends with Jung, but they didn't know about the analysis. Yep. And uh, a lot of people uh, suggested to Pally that he not publish in the same book as Jung mm -hmm. that made his reputation. Yeah. Now, this is, I mean, it's really, really interesting. And that's it also, I mean, the other thing it does is, of course, reinforces the importance of history of science and, and you know, rigorous history of Absolutely. science to understand how who, knowledge who, comes into being. Who these people were, what, actually, people what, what motivated actually, them. Exactly. I mean, they didn't just sit at their desk and continually write equations. Yeah, uh, thinking about other things about uh, what ramifications of their work and yep. the roots of their work, the roots of their field. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think this is this is incredibly fascinating. Um, we have one question. I wanted to ask the next question about AI, but I'll, I'll uh, where someone uh, wants to know your opinion on can we say that consciousness is independent of subjectiveness? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I maybe. Don't you I don't, don't, okay. don't really understand that. So maybe, I mean, maybe uh, I'll. Sorry, go on. A subject, subjectivity and consciousness. They're, uh, well, they're certainly related to one another. I mean, consciousness is a subjective thing. Uh, although, again, with programming into a machine, it may lose its. It, it, it may be a. a it, it is a quantifiable thing yep. in AI. So, if that is some sort of relation, but of course, machines will become subjective. So yeah, I mean, there is, there is a relation all the way around. Think, things are changing. You have to uh, uh, look at what machines will be like in the future, what will be like in the future, and what yep. the combination of us with machines will be like in the future. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, I mean, you, uh, when you were speaking, I thought of Philip Dick's book, of course, you know, do Android, yeah, right. and, you know, yeah. and, and then you of course mentioned it. So it was great that, you know, I was on, on the right track with you. Um, and it reminded me also of Ron Hubbard's fear which both Stephen King and um, uh, and Philip K. Dick refer to and you know think of think of it as an interesting thing uh, right. uh, let me I mean I, I allow me allow me to to read a little um, a few sentences from a lecture that Philip Dick gave about um, you know Andro androids and humans and it resonates of course I mean as you will know you know given that you, you I mean you will know no you already know um, so for the benefit of our of our of our listeners um, so Philip Dick says, our environment, and I mean our man-made world of machines, artificial constructs, computers, electronic systems, interlinking homeostatic components, all of this is in fact beginning more and more to possess what the earnest psychologists fear the primitive sees in his environment, animation. In a very real sense, our environment is becoming alive or at least quasi alive and in ways specifically and fundamentally analogous to ourselves. Rather than learning about ourselves by studying our constructs, perhaps we should make the attempt to comprehend what our constructs, what our constructs are up to by looking into what we ourselves. Right, are that, was, that, was, that was the big worry of Pauli also, looking into the relationship between sensations and, yeah. the, and, the, and, and the statements of a scientific theory. For Pauli, that could only be uh, resolved by going outside of science into psychology and coming to the conclusion that archetypes yep. relate sensations to the, the axioms of a scientific theory. Yep. No, absolutely fascinating. And 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 what I what I you know I'm I'm tempted at a at a very I'm tempted to ask you a very trivial question, or maybe even a flippant question, but I'm going to ask you anyway, which is you know you spoke about. Um, uh, the, the mirror images for psychology and physics. And I was wondering, is there any, what, well, what kind of relationship can we then extrapolate between, not necessarily from that observation, but otherwise between human intelligence and machine intelligence? Do you have an observation to make which we can take away? Yeah, they're gonna be, they're gonna be the same. There is only, I think artificial intelligence is an oxymoron. Mm. There's only one sort of intelligence and you shouldn't make, you shouldn't add on adjectives uh because it's because it's not human mm. i mean yes. intelligence it, it's an it's an alien intelligence i mean we're we're moving around in the world right now 
I mean, you don't have to go to Mars to look for alien intelligences, alien beings that are developing right next to us, machines, mm -hmm. and we're, we're merging with them. That, that's mm -hmm. a remarkable thing about it. So there's, there's only one thing called intelligence, and it, it may be different than alien beings, but nevertheless, it is intelligence. Mm -hmm. that's, and consciousness, too. Yeah, I found that, I, I mean, I find this observation sort of, you know, it, it, I, I'm reminded of what the University of Cambridge decided to call call the center. They call it the center for the future of intelligence rather than calling it. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And I find that most, uh, most, most interesting and compelling. Yeah. Right. So uh, with that, I'm going to thank you for a really, really fascinating well, lecture and writing. a wonderful story. Uh, wonderful to have you with us uh, on the second day of Psyche. And I have some housekeeping things to just finish before we say goodbye. The recording of all our lectures will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So those of you who want to share this lecture now with your friends, please do direct them there. Um, do explore the exhibit Change My Mind by Andrew Carney, who was also present yesterday during Stellark's lecture and of course, Synthetic Self by Stellark, which you will find um, again, connecting very well into what you heard today. Do consider signing up for a lecture by Ali Hosseini entitled, Can Machines Come Alive? Taking this theme further, and you know, you will, you will find the observations kind of coming together, which discusses recent advances in systems biology and applies them to the question of, of course, technological progress and animation. Um, do give us your feedback and do keep coming back because, you know, we hope you enjoyed today and we hope that you'll enjoy the future lectures too. Thank you again, Arthur, for a wonderful evening. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.